Hello and welcome to Close Reading Classic Literature with me, Dr Octavia Cox. Today I'm going to be looking at the beautiful poem I Am by John Clare. I'm going to begin by running through some of the intellectual context and biographical context, so Clare's time in the lunatic asylum. Then I'm going to move on to look at the poem itself and some of the techniques, even in this very short poem, that John Clare utilises, particularly his use of diction and his use of form. Remember, if you like what I do here on my channel, do please subscribe so you'll see my new weekly videos when they're uploaded. Very quickly, I want to run through some background to John Clare's poem, I Am. And in some ways, we can see John Clare's poem as a challenge to the certainties that were presented in the Age of Reason and the Age of Enlightenment, as they were called, which was the 18th century. So in the mid 17th century, René Descartes, the philosopher, had said famously, cogito ergo sum, translated as I think, therefore I am. From this beginning, there grew during the course of the 18th century commitment to ideas of reason. So Descartes, in some ways, you can see as the founder of the school of epistemology, and that really focuses on the idea that reason is central to our understanding of the world, and that reason obviously comes from the mind, the individual's mind. If you can be certain of nothing else, what you can at least be certain of is, I think, therefore I I am. I exist and I know that I exist because I can think. And we can see this interest in idea of the self and the idea of the thinking self manifested in much romantic poetry, which focuses often on an examination of the self, as well as in ideas of the poet's place in the world. But as I've said, Claire's poem rejects some of this certainty of the commitment to reason, commitment to the very notion of I think, therefore I am. And we can see this from the poem's very opening, which I will get onto in a minute, I am yet and that yet there is crucial you could just say i am and that's the end of the matter but obviously you wouldn't then have a poem but also that simply saying i am claire isn't certain of that and there's the nagging yet that continues in the 1830s, Clare's mental health had been in decline. He was inflicted with depression, he was afflicted with insomnia, nightmares, and he began to lose his sense of self and his sense of identity. So on the advice of his publisher, John Taylor, he became a voluntary patient at Dr. Allen's lunatic asylum at High Beach in Epping Forest, which is on the outskirts of London. And he was a patient there from June 1837 to to July 1841. And while he was there, he suffered from delusions and he imagined himself to be, for example, Nord Nelson, hero of the Battle of Trafalgar from 1805, as well as fellow romantic poets. So Claire imagined that he was Sir Walter Scott, for example, author of the Waverley novels, very, very, very popular novelist, the most popular novelist of the Romantic period. He also imagined himself to be Robert Burns, the Scottish poet, and Lord Byron and Claire even wrote his own versions of Byron's popular poems Child Harold and Don Juan. So he was really struggling with his sense of identity, struggling with his sense of self. He did not have that certainty of I think therefore I am or that certainty in the idea of I exist because I think. So on the 20th of July 1841 Claire escaped from the asylum and walked the 80 or so miles back to Northamptonshire which Claire recorded in his journey out of Essex which is a really fascinating read if you're interested in representations of mental health in the mid 19th century. Soon afterwards Claire was committed to Northampton General Lunatic Asylum, this time by order, and it was by order of Fenwick Scrimshire, which is an absolutely fabulous name, and William Page. Claire was certified insane in December 1841 on the grounds of being addicted to poetical prosing. Quite a thing to be committed to a lunatic asylum for, particularly if you are a poet. In fact, in the Romantic period, there had been a real worry about what they called metromania, which was a mania for writing verses for writing poetry and indeed a critic of John Keats worried that Keats had metromania. 
Claire remained at the asylum for over 20 years until his death on the 20th of May 1864. So I am, which he composed at least by the 20th of December 1846, was written while he was in Northampton General Lunatic Asylum. So before I analyse and look in more detail at the specifics of the poem, I'm just going to read all the way through it because it's a really powerful poem, I think. I am, yet what I am, none cares or knows. My friends forsake me like a memory lost. I am the self-consumer of my woes. They rise and vanish in oblivion's host, like shadows in love's frenzied, stifled throes. And yet I am, and live, like vapours tossed into the nothingness of scorn and noise, into the living sea of waking dreams, where there is neither sense of life or joys. But the vast shipwreck of my life's esteems. Even the dearest, that I love the best, are strange, nay, rather stranger than the rest. I long for scenes where man hath never trod, a place where woman never smiled or wept, there to abide with my Creator, God and sleep as I in childhood sweetly slept, untroubling and untroubled where I lie, the grass below, above the vaulted sky. As a whole poem, I am challenges the certainty, as I've said, of the Descartian notion that I think, therefore, I am. What if you're not sure you can think and reason, which Claire was very uncertain about having lived in the lunatic asylum for a number of years? What if your sense of self is hosted by something else, rising and vanishing, shadows and vapours tossed into nothingness, as Claire describes them. It's also a rejection of the individualistic and indeed solitary nature of I am. And you can see that this is a challenge in some ways to many of the certainties also of romantic poetry, Wordsworthian type of poetry, which very much rests on the foundation of I am and that poetry is an exploration of my thinking self. So more important than I am for Claire, and you can see this in the opening line, is what I am. That's the question. I am, yet what I am. He can't figure out. That's what's still puzzling him. That's what's still troubling him. Claire has neither sense of life or joys because he feels a stranger to those he loves, who you would think he would most understand and would most understand him, and yet that's what he feels most strange. He is seeking not romantic isolation, but connection. And we can see this in the third stanza. I long for scenes there to abide with my creator God. So he longs to be with, to abide with, to live with. That's what he longs for. He longs for the sense of connection, not I am as an isolated unit, but to abide with. On earth, what he loves seems strange. And this is a central paradox, a central conundrum, that what should be most known seems most strange and makes Claire long for certainty, the certainty of God, not the certainty of I think, therefore I am, not the certainty of self, because he's not sure that that can be certain. There's a sense in the poem of an intangibility on earth or where man Man treads. And so he longs for alternative scenes. He longs to abide with God, which is far more tangible to him than life on earth. Claire imagines being alive as being in the living sea of waking dreams. It's a beautiful, evocative image, but it's very far away from a sense of certainty. Living is like living in a sea of waking dreams, constantly moving. You're not sure if you're awake or if you're asleep. Whereas being dead, he imagines as sleep as I in childhood, sweetly slept, with grass 
below, with earth below. So he imagines that death seems much more firm and solid than being alive in the present state, which feels like living on a sea, living in the sea. So I now want quickly to look at some elements of Clare's diction in the poem, his choice of words. As I've said from the very opening, it's the yet that does a lot of work. I am yet what I am. Because Claire can't just accept I am. There remains that troubling yet. And we can see the sense of trouble that comes up in the final stanza when Claire uses negation. So he uses untroubling and untroubled. Always in text, the use of negation is interesting because what it does kind of conversely is highlights the opposite. So when you say I am untroubled, what you're actually doing is suggesting that much of the time you are troubled by saying I am untroubled, by hinting at the negation, by using the negation, you're in fact hinting that there's a vacillation between the negated state and the positive state, between troubled and untroubled. That's different from saying something like I am calm. If you say I am untroubled, there's more tension already in that use of negation than there is in simply using the positive. I also think it's interesting the way that in the first stanza, Claire hyphenates self-consumer and there's a double meaning meaning because of this hyphenation, I am the self-consumer of my woes. Claire is the, the sole consumer of his woes, the self-consumer of my woes, he says, but also his woes make him self-consuming. I am the self-consumer of my woes, almost as though he's a self-cannibal, this self-destructive sense coming in through his use of his hyphen compound epithet, self-consumer. Because again, I could have said I am the consumer of my woes, but adding in the self-consumer hints at this idea of being self-destructive, that he's kind of eating himself, that he can't escape himself, but he knows that this is damaging. He knows that this is self-consuming, not nutritious, but he still doesn't feel any sense of connection to anything else outside of himself while he's kind of existing, while he's living in the sea. I also want to talk about the form of the poem. So as you can see, it's broken up into three stanzas. The first and second stanzas are enjambed. So there's enjambment going between the first and the second stanza, like vapours tossed into the nothingness of scorn and noise. Rather like I am yet what I am. There's a sense that it isn't contained, that I am isn't contained, that it goes on into the next stanza or bleeds into the next stanza like a sea, like a boundless sea, that there's no fixed edge of self. There's no certainty in a sense of self. It bleeds off like vapours tossed into the nothingness. And you can see that in the final line, yet I am and live like vapours tossed. So again, he cannot settle after I am. Continues on this boundlessness, this lack of certainty. But then you get to the end of the second stanza and there is a rest on the word rest. And indeed, there's even a full stop at the end of the second stanza. So this punctuation separates him off from the rest of the world. So he says, even the dearest that I love best are strange, nay, rather stranger than the rest. So there's a sense of those he loves feeling strange, the rest of the world feeling strange too, even though not quite as strange. And that's ended there. And then he moves on to I long. He's leaving the rest of the world behind him when he moves into the third stanza, which is when he moves on to talking about what he hopes for the future and what he longs for, which is death and hopefully a kind of childlikeness in death without being troubled by everything he's troubled with when he's living. Now, of course, exact punctuation is always difficult in John Clare's poetry because he didn't use grammar really himself and the poems were transcribed by W.F. Knight, who was the house steward at the time in the asylum. He was the house steward between 1845 and 1850. So the it's not can't really rely on the punctuation, but the thought comes to an end at the end of this stanza anyway, in a way that it doesn't at the end of the first stanza. We know that there's enjambment like vapours tossed into the nothingness, but we know that the thought comes to rest at 
the word rest and then moves on. So I think it's a point that's that stands, even if we say perhaps the full stop wasn't Claire's own full stop. I also want to look at the opening of each of the three stanzas, the beginning few words. I am into the nothingness I long. And that's the central movement within the poem, that I am into the nothingness. That's what he feels. He's not certain of his existence or his sense of self. He's not certain of I, because that, that only leads him into a sense of nothingness. So all he can do then is long. I long for other things. If you can't know what you are, you can know that you long for something else. You can be certain of that. And having a sense of what you are not ties into what I was saying earlier about Claire's use of negation. So in the first stanza, we see the phrase I am four times. I am, yet what? I am. I am the self-consumer and yet I am. So it's it's going from a sense of grasping at the certainty of I am and then moving away from the certainty of that because it moves into how he lives and yet I am and live and that is far less sure. He lives like vapours so a simile is brought in. He lives into nothingness. So you live almost sort of through other things. And it's then in the third stanza that he finds some sense of connection with, in the use of the word with. So the first stanza then, we have these four uses of I am, but thereafter there's a, a loss of surety, almost a disintegration of self in the second stanza, where he feels nothingness into the nothingness, into the living sea of waking dreams. There's no sense of life, no sense of joys, but the vast shipwreck of my life's esteems. Gosh, such a desperate line. Even the dearest that I love are strange. So what you would hope would feel most sure to you is stranger than anything else. In the whole poem then, John Clare longs for the peace and innocence of childhood and the grave, because in both states you're untroubled by the question, what am I? I do hope you've enjoyed, and perhaps enjoyed isn't quite the right word, but I do hope you found this unpicking of one of the most desolate of poems, useful, beautiful poem, but very desolate. If you like what I do here on my channel, do please subscribe and hit the thumbs up, check out my other videos and do comment down below. I really do love hearing what you think and I'd love to know your thoughts on this wonderful poem by John Clare.